Okay, so today for our forms training of the week, I wanted to look at a couple things we're doing and how we're choosing our forms. With so many forms in our form catalog, um, there can be some confusion on which ones to use to get our desired outcomes. And as realtors, we're required to have the skill and care of a lawyer. So the forms we select are crucial to our success. Um, so think about this. Are you using the correct forms? Are you utilizing the forms available when there is one that meets your needs? Or do you find yourself using a blank form maybe more than you should? So I'm just going to go through a few forms that get confused a little bit and hopefully bring some clarity on how to use these ones. Um, I am not going to get too deep into some of the contingencies I'm going to talk about, but I will bring up when it is appropriate to use certain forms over others. Okay, so first of all, with our listings, we fill out our listing agreements. We fill out the 1A, our listing input sheet. And before it goes live, um, you know, if a change is needed, Sometimes we'll just take all the listing paperwork, scratch everything off and redo it. Um, sometimes we won't. Sometimes we'll just make these minor changes. So when you are amending a listing agreement before it goes live, there's a different form to use than one for after it goes live. So before it goes live, we are going to be technically amending the listing agreement because until it is live, we have nothing on the MLS to change. It's still just an agreement between the firm and the client. If you are thinking of changing a price or making some other minor changes, this is the appropriate form you wanna use. Um, keep in mind too, if you select the agreement extended paragraph down there, it actually does not extend the list date. It extends the entire contract for your listing agreement until the expiration date you write in. So if your intention is to just extend the list date, do not use that line. You could be cutting yourself short. Instead, that line is for specifically the end of your listing contract. So I pulled them side by side right here. Amendment to the listing agreement is before it goes live. After it goes live, any status changes should be done on form 19. So we have here before live, after going live. There's been some confusion between financing and evidence of funds. One of our forms in here protects, has a contingency, contingency protection and the other one does not. So the 22EF is only a disclosure of the funds and where they are coming from. The 22EF also provides verbiage that ties down the funds to the home sale and if it's spent incorrectly will result in a buyer default. It's my personal opinion that all contracts should have a 22EF. Um, I know not everybody agrees with that, but you are welcome to try to change my mind on this. So think about what your client actually needs. Do they need a contingency protection to get financing? Do they want a contingency protection for a low appraisal? All these things should be going through your mind when considering which of these forms you would use. Now, both of these do offer a, a clause in there that obligates that seller to allow um, access to the home for the bank, um, any inspections required by the bank, appraisals required by the bank. So in that sense, they are the same. However, if you are interested in keeping a contingency, make sure you're using the 22A. If it is just a disclosure of where the money is coming from, make sure you're using the 22EF. Sometimes when we are communicating back and forth with paperwork and we're in a situation of offers and counter offers, we may be trying to do things as quickly as possible to make sure we can lock down a home. 
Um, so sometimes it happens where we'll just pop in a form 34, which is the blank form, instead of actually using a counter offer form, because you know high pressure situations may not give us enough time to do a counter offer. We may not want to put the ball back in their court. So think about what the implications of using a blank form versus a counter offer form when you're trying to negotiate terms in your contract. If you are negotiating and this is the deal that your clients want and they are not willing to accept anything different, um, you should be using a counter offer form. So anything that has to be tied to the contract itself at mutual acceptance, we're using a 36. A form 34 creates no obligation for either person until it's signed around completely. If this is something that you can negotiate later down the road, it's not a make it or break it. A 34 might be appropriate for you. Um, but if you are in a counteroffer situation, make sure everything goes on this form 36. And as a side note, I would also like to add, um, if you are using a counteroffer form, avoid hashing out the contract and using the counteroffer form. Just pick one or the other, because what will happen in the long run is if you have a counteroffer form attached, and then your contract has hashed out markings all over it, it's going to look like your counteroffer supersedes everything that you've also negotiated in that contract and it creates confusion. Um, and the whole idea of using these forms is to create less confusion and more clarity between these. Um, so again, for 34, it is in addition to an already agreed upon contract, um, the 34 can be approved or denied without affecting mutual acceptance. And with the counter offer form, the 36, any item that's on here will be included once it's signed around for mutual acceptance. The addition of this will affect mutual acceptance and nothing will be reached until it is signed. But once it is, the items that are on here are now part of the contract. Termination or rescission. So there is actually a really big difference between whether you should terminate or rescind a contract. And um, this, is, this is kind of a big deal if you have any, any contingency protections left over for your buyer. So what does it mean when you terminate versus rescind? Um, I just pulled up a random termination form right here. And this is the rescission form next to it. Um, the biggest difference between termination and rescission is that one of them does not require both signatures and one of them does. If you terminate, this means your client had the right to back out of the contract legally without breach. And they are exercising that right by using the termination appropriate for why they're backing out. They do not need the seller's initials, signatures, approval, or anything else if they have the, con the contractual right to back out of the contract. Now, a rescission has to be a mutually accepted decision. So this is saying, you know, we, we may not have the right to back out of it, but both parties agree that it's probably best if we do this. Um, a rescission agreement should hardly ever be used when you have the ability to use a termination. So has anybody ever been in a situation where maybe they haven't had the right to terminate, but both parties agree that maybe this just isn't going to work out for the best and has had to use a rescission? If not, Using a termination is going to be much more clean. Um, I have had a situation where financing failed. So this would have been the appropriate way to terminate with financing. However, um, because the financing failed, it was with a bank that wasn't incredibly competent 
And I was worried that the letter that needed to attach to this financing, dec um, de the decline financing, wouldn't necessarily check off all the boxes required by the 22A to get the money back. So because both parties agreed that that's why they decided to end the contract, a rescission was signed by the seller releasing the earnest money. So they avoided having to get that letter from the lender by signing the rescission. What a rescission also means though is it's as if nothing ever happened. So it kind of, kind of just erases the whole thing from, from day one. Um, it's not a lineal, um, these events happened, therefore I can back out. It's just almost like changing your mind. So when you're thinking about termination, please think of any notices you can give, any rights that your client has to terminate before ever considering signing the rescission agreement. Um, I didn't put it in the slides, but also close to the form 51 is the form 50. So if you do terminate and you want to make sure the earnest money comes back to your client, you need to also have a form 50 signed with your termination that tells escrow where to put the earnest money. Hopefully put it back in your, in your buyer's pocket. Um, another one that's been kind of used, you know, back and forth, they're kind of as a, as a blanketed statement here, is the home inspection and the feasibility contingency. So I just wanted to broadly say that if you're doing a home inspection on a large piece of land, the home inspection contingency is for the home. It's for the structure of the home. It's for things inside the home. In fact, it's not even for the systems attached to the home. It is just the home and the things that are all within the walls of the home. Um, you will additionally need things like well inspection and septic inspection um, and anything outside the walls of the structure, if you want to make sure that the land use is going to be available for what you want, you're also going to want the addition of a feasibility contingency. So home inspection means the home, the walls, the roof, the things inside, the integrity of the building. Um, the feasibility is the land use. So it is the buildability, um, it is lot lines, it is um, maybe you wanna make sure you're not in wetlands. There is a very broad use for the feasibility addendum. And there is a very broad use for the home inspection addendum. Just keep the two separate. When you have land, use land. When you have a home, use the home. And if you are buying a piece of land that has a teardown shack on it, it is a feasibility. It is not a home inspection unless you actually plan on going inside the home and inspecting the structure itself. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So a lot of condos, a lot of HOAs around here. Um, when do you do an HOA review versus the title contingency? And are they interchangeable? Should you use them both together? You know, what's the difference between these two here? Um, the title contingency is pretty specific. It has a contingency for the buyer to look over and make sure there is nothing that's going to prevent them from doing the things they are hoping to do with this um, with the home or property. So they will be finding out things like uh, liens that are on it or um, the CCNRs will show up on the title contingency. You'll be able to see if maybe they do or don't allow chickens, which you know might be a, a, a go or a no-go for your client. Um, 
the one thing about the title contingency, it's, it's not necessarily a get out of jail free contingency. There has to be something that that buyer disapproves of and in doing so needs to have removed from the title. So they can't add anything to the title. If they see that there's no view um, easement, they can't go back with the title contingency and say, you know what, I'm not gonna buy this because you don't have a view easement and you need to put it in there. They don't have that right. It is not your get out of jail free card. It is a very specific, I found this in the title that makes me unable to use my property and I would like it removed from the title report. Um, they get the supplements, they get basic title and every every supplement that's involved in the title, making sure it's marketable, that's, that's a no-brainer, but that is another um, bullet point that's on this contingency. Now, if they want something that's more in-depth, if there is an HOA, the HOA is not going to send all of the HOA documents and have all of the meeting minutes and the financials in a title contingency. That is something that is a separately pulled document, um, usually from the HOA board directly, not necessarily through the title. You may find out that there's an HOA through the title contingency that you didn't know about, but in order to get the bylaws, the meeting minutes, the um, financials, you need to actually have the box on 22D checked to receive those things. Now, 22D is more of a get out of jail free card for your client because there's something that um, it has that the title contingency doesn't have. And that is this first sentence right here that says buyer's sole discretion. So the buyer has the sole discretion to decide if they want to go ahead and move forward with the HOA information they've received. So as a bullet point and a recap, a title contingency has to have a reason to reject. And optional clauses, um, HOA review can be at the buyer's sole discretion. So the 22D is more of a contingency. The title review is also a contingency, but it is not the type of contingency that gives the freedom that you may think that they have with that contingency. All right. Well, I pulled together those documents thinking they would have um, a lot more talking points, but those are just the few that I wanted to start with. I know that those have been some of the hot topics of what I've seen come through. I wanted to make sure that there was no confusion on that. And um, if anybody has any situations where they've come up with the use of a form, maybe not matching up to what they think should have been done, I am completely open and would love to hear your story.